Since the history of humanity is much shorter than the history of the universe, we have a huge problem to consider which galaxies evolve and how in the observable universe. So the first one will be galaxy formation within the most acceptable framework we have in cosmology right now, which is called the Lambda CDN. The second point that we will cover is uh, evolution of galaxies seen from the large extragalactic survey they were performed in the last 70 years. And the third point is how did our theoretical knowledge of galaxy evolution and formation match the observational knowledge? At the end, you will see how bright is the future of galaxy evolution. Let's start. So when we are talking about the galaxy formation and evolution within the Lambda CDM, we can ask ourselves the uh, one question, which is, why is it important to understand the connection between the dark matter halos and the baryons in the universe? So once we want to understand what is the evolution of galaxies, we can also make a comparison to the evolution of some other things. For example, chess game. Chess game starts from the homo homogeneous beginning and ends in a very heterogeneous way. So uh, this is much about the history of the universe. We have a homogeneous and then heterogeneous. So the connection between the beginning and the end is largely unknown. So the job of astronomers exploring the evolution of galaxies is to understand how did it happen. In this slide, you see below the map of the CMB map by the one of the most recent European Space Agency launch telescopes called Planck. And uh, if you see by eye, you can see that uh, this map looks much more uh, very isotropic and homogeneous looking from the distance, which certainly tells us that maybe we should expect that most of the things in the nature are like that, which is certainly not true because looking in the smaller scales, we can see a very diverse population of objects we know as galaxies. Talking about the most important facts of the galaxy formation evolution, we can uh, model them in a three different ways. So the first very important step is to consider the cosmology uh, then the second one are initial conditions, and the third one that I'm going to talk much about is, in this lecture is physics. Most of these things are covered in a very good way, but our knowledge about the uh, evolution of um, the physical conditions between the galaxies in different times is largely unknown. And the, one of the most important goals of the current extragalactic surveys is actually to provide a better knowledge of the physics of galaxies in the different uh, epochs of the universe. So what is the uh, contents of the universe if we count uh, all the things that consist in it? So around 70% of the universe consists in the dark energy, which is a kind of mysterious uh, energy that shapes the acceleration of the universe. Then we have a dark matter for which we believe that um, explain around 25% of the content of the universe. And then at the rest, we have ordinary matter which contributes to around 5%. In this 5%, stars in galaxies are contributing a very small amount, but they are one of the most leading players and crucial to our understanding of the evolution of galaxies. You can see why. When we start from the merging of dark matter halos in the early history of the universe, we can consider that merging as a tree. In fact, today, from the simulations, we know that merging of these halos happened in the early epochs of the universe, and then these halos grow from the bottom to the top. For example, like this. But the problem comes with the other components. For example, from this slide, you can see how the dark matter density matches the gas density and then the temperature and metallicity around a certain region seen in simulations, most recent called Illustris. From bottom to the top are the evolution of these uh, structures seen from the past to the present. By eye, even if you don't know what these colors are explaining, you can easily see that the difference in the densities are very correlated. So the one of the observational and theoretical goals of the current uh, astrophysics and cosmology is to understand how these links are actually built. Another important contributor apart from the dark matter are, as I said, stars. 
Stars are born in giant molecular clouds, and uh, the cycle of the star formation you can see uh, sketched in this small uh, cartoon. So the cycle of star formation can be seen either from observations or simulations. So on the top of this slide, you can see one small uh, snapshot from the diagram from the simulation that is performed with a very high resolution. And uh, these lines are explaining when star formation peaked and, and what time after the merging of two different uh, galaxies. So as you can see, there are two different peaks saying that there are two uh, bursting events related to this particular galaxy. But here we are talking just about one galaxy and one specific uh, star formation history which is related to that galaxy. As we know today, in the universe exist a hundreds of thousands of extragalactic objects we know as galaxies. So we actually have to model and understand diversity of these time scales for different events of um, formation of stars in these galaxies. So this leads us to the second topic that we are going to cover, uh, which is the world of evolving galaxies in the universe. And the question we can ask is how uh, we can explore the different ways of the evolution of galactic populations. Uh, at the very beginning era of, um, let's say, classification of galaxies, uh, starting from Edwin Hubble and Vesta Slipher, uh, the galaxies were selected in uh, what is today known as a Hubble classification. And uh, most of the morphological classes can be separated in, in these ways. So we have uh, ellipticals, then uh, a spirals, and then some irregular galaxies that uh, we actually cannot uh, easily distinguish from the, some other shapes. But uh, apart from this morphological classification, we have much uh, more very complex uh, contributions. They are making the diversity of galaxies even uh, more harder to understand, which are colors, for example, being galaxies red or blue, then their morphology, as you can see in this diagram, then uh, the time the galaxies consume a gas to form their stars, then uh, environment of these galaxies, for example, uh, is the evolution of galaxies the same in the dense or under-dense environments, or uh, how the nuclear activity, which is unrelated to star formation, for example, coming from the active galactic nucleus, contributing to the evolution of galaxies. So, once seeing this uh, picture, which explains actually where we found the most distant galaxies in the universe, which is the, this one at the redshift 11.1, .1, and the redshift tells us about the distance from the present to the past, and uh, this redshift is related to galaxies that were found less than 300 millions of years after the Big Bang. And in the present day, we know that uh, the whole observable universe is old around 13.79 billions of years. So some small samples of galaxies are observed in a very distant uh, past, and some uh, more selection of statistically confirmed galaxies are observed in this region. And then, of course, the most uh, prominent samples and uh, most of the knowledge of physics of galaxies uh, we have from the local samples. So the goal of the evolution of galaxies is to build a statistical sample of different populations, so to study some particular uh, behavior of galaxies across the cosmic time, and then to understand some um, uh, statistical or physical properties of them. So some very important questions that we can ask uh, related to the uh, evolution of galaxies can be, for example, how many of galaxies are in the universe, how galaxies evolve for such an early cosmic times to present, then uh, what is the stellar content of different galaxy populations, how they relate to environments, their dark matter halos, or how often galaxies are clustered or isolated. All these things comes to the one very important conclusion. We need statistics, and that statistics can be used to uh, understand the behavior of the galaxies in different cosmic times. So one simple physics explaining the galaxy evolution could be presented as this sketch. So we have a gas content which is related to the formation of stars in galaxies. And then this gas which comes into the galaxy can be consumed by long-lived stars and then expel is an uh, outflow. So uh, there are different indicators of the star formation that we can use uh, studying the galaxies. For example, uh, I picked some of the submillimeter lines that I'm using in my research, which are tracer for very cold interstellar medium. And some of these are, for example, uh, nitrogen 
or atomic carbon or um, uh, neutral um, uh, carbon, then uh, molecular um, gas seen in CO, and then very dense uh, molecules is H HCN or HCO. Related to the birth of the galaxies, we can also ask ourselves uh, what causes that, or uh, as astrophysicists said, quenching of massive galaxies. And there are diverse processes that we believe are responsible for this kind of quenching. And none of them are uh, a priori used in today's extragalactic research because we actually cannot um, distinguish between the most important uh, of them in the massive uh, galaxies. But some of them are, for example, AGM feedback, then viral shock heating, stellar feedback, or morphological quenching in very massive galaxies. So if we uh, want to see how these morphologies and stellar uh, and gas content evolves, uh, we can uh, use, for example, output of the simulation and uh, simply placing some examples in different redshifts and different masses in stellar content and gas content. We can see what is the connection of uh, stars and gas in the galaxies in different cosmic times. So by eye, we can see that even morphology is changing, then some uh, merger events are experiencing as well. The gas content is also closely connected to the content of stars. The color of these uh, uh, galaxies is also changing from much bluer, which um, uh, explains the active star formation, to redder, compact, and elliptical galaxies that we can see in the present universe. They have a very, very little or completely no ongoing star formation. So if we want to place this as a big picture, uh, the main question we want to ask studying the evolution of galaxies can be sketched in this way. So from the very early universe, we have some unknown processes that are actually pooping the large stellar masses in these very bursty galaxies and massive galaxies we observed with a powerful telescope that I'm going to show in the next slides. Then we have to worry about the time scales from which this gas is consumed, then passing through some uh, very diverse uh, evolutionary steps, for example, this uh, a quasar state, then going to the very compact and passive galaxy, and probably, as the most of the theoretical models stated, grow the stellar mass with a very dry merges, then ending as a very uh, bright and uh, very huge local elliptical galaxy in the local cluster. So the questions related to these stages can be, how could such massive galaxies have been formed so early? The second one is, what stops or suppress the star formation in these bursty galaxies? And do we understand the time scales for transitions between these galaxy populations? So in the present universe, we know that there are different galaxies and different morph morphologies. So saying about the colors, we can say that some of them are red, so with no uh, ongoing star formation, and blue with very active star formation. So astronomers are usually, uh, they really like to use uh, color diagrams to explain uh, these sort of diversities. As we can see here, colors versus luminosity of galaxies, which says that we can divide a galaxies according to their colors as a red coming from the red sequence and the blue galaxies with ongoing star formation occupying this blue cloud. There is also an intermediate population of galaxies with astronomers uh, called a green valley. But to get a much more uh, refined view of uh, physical processes inside these galaxies, we have to really understand and uh, construct their spectral energy distribution. And this is one example of the spectral energy distribution called SED of galaxies. On the x-axis, you can see observed wavelength while on the epsilon axis, uh, we have observed flux. So flux is coming from the optical uh, near-infrared regime to far-infrared regime, sub-millimeter regime, and ending in the radio. So here, I mark the most important telescopes that are active right now, um, observing these points that we're uh, using for the modeling of the SEDs. Some of these telescopes are plotted here. For example, in the mid-infrared regime, we have space telescopes such as WISE, Spitzer, or Herschel in the far infrared, or very um, important and expensive millimeter telescopes such as SCUBA, South Pole Telescope, and the most powerful interferometer in the Earth called ALMA. 
So why SEDs are important? Once studying the large extragalactic fields uh, in all directions, so on the north and also on the southern hemisphere, we can trace the diverse galaxy populations and their uh, characteristics seen in these SEDs. So all these white marks here are related to some of the most uh, either widest or uh, deepest uh, extragalactic fields that we explore till now. The largest one is this one called Age Atlas, while the deepest ones are Eggs, Cosmos, Butes, or Deep Field South. Why is it important to firstly understand the telescope characteristics uh, prior to understanding the characteristics of the output of their measurements is because telescopes came with different sensitivities and different resolutions. As a comparison here, I put one of the most powerful optical telescopes in the Earth called uh, Subaru. It's a uh, Mauna Kea mountain in Hawaii uh, with a mirror of 8.2 meters with a very powerful resolution of less than one arc second. Comparing to these telescopes, we have sub-millimeter telescope uh, on the same uh, mountain in Hawaii, but with one mirror at 15 meters seeing in sub-millimeter regime with a much worse resolution of 14 arc seconds. Why this is important? Because seeing from the shorter to larger wavelength, our view of the same universe, the same patch of the sky get worse. Which means that the most objects is contributing to the one side of the spectra to the other one of this other side of the spectra. That means that uh, the scientists they are going to explore, let's say, a submillimeter or infrared uh, regime of the SED, have to be very careful matching the proper counterparts of these galaxies to the galaxies observed in the shorter wavelengths. What we know today is that most of these galaxies observed from shorter wavelengths are placed in this side of the history of the universe, while some of the most distant galaxies and dusty galaxies are observed in this submillimeter regime and they're placed here. Of course, their total number is uh, much less than the number of these optically selected sources and we will see why. So, as an example, I put just one small pixel from the infrared telescope seen in the very powerful optical telescope. As you can see, one small pixel in infrared can be resolved in the thousands or even dozens of galaxies seen in the optical, and this is just a few uh, arc seconds, which means that uh, these galaxies are contributing to the, just a part of the, the total star formation rate measured by the whole uh, infrared instrument. So the view of the infrared instrument is around 36 arc seconds, while this line is saying that the distance between these galaxies is just two arc seconds. So basically using uh, very powerful optical or uh, radio interferometers or optical telescopes, we can resolve these bright spots in a huge amount of galaxies that we're actually trying to understand and trying to understand which of these galaxies is actually a real counterpart of the very bright dusty source observed, supposedly, in the distant universe. So what we can infer from these spectral energy distributions? We have stellar light, which says that they are tracing the formation of young stars, and also we have a dust emission, which says the same. So in the ideal case, the star formation rate seen in these galaxies can be a total combination of parameters related to the uh, UV luminosity plus uh, parameters they are, correct, uh, they are using as a correction and then um, uh, luminosity seen in the infrared. Of course, uh, in a very distant universe, because of the obscuration of dust, this UV observed galaxies cannot be directly seen even with the most powerful telescopes such as Hubble. That means that the most of the distant galaxies can be selected just directly from the dust. And here I just placed some basic formulas that astronomers are using to infer some physical properties of these galaxies. For example, infrared luminosity, which is an integral below this curve, or star formation rate, which is uh, some uh, calibration factor multiplied by the luminosity inferred from this formula. From the statistics of galaxies, 
we can see a lot of different, let's say, varieties in the uh, different populations of galaxies and their physical properties. One of the most important uh, characteristics of galaxies in the universe is called stellar mass function, which actually st says uh, what is the amount of galaxies with uh, certain masses uh, following in the, uh, certain cosmic times. So here we have plotted a curves of uh, different galaxies in some certain stellar mass beams from the very local universe to the very distant universe. So this number says that this is the high massive end of the stars. So the stars falling in this regime are the most massive ones. So as you can see, the most massive galaxies here in the local universe are the one they have a very small ongoing star formation which is not the true in the very distant universe where, where the most of the massive galaxies are actually very powerful star forming. So how some of these very powerful star forming galaxies in the distant universe look like? This is the most extreme example and this is actually the most distant dusty galaxy seen in the universe. It's on a redshift 6.9, almost 7, and it's fall in the era we know as reionization. This is the view of the dust observed with ALMA telescope. If you want to see how this galaxy looks like in the optical view, you can see something like this. So nothing. Which means that dust completely obscure the whole view of this very distant and powerful galaxy. We don't know how many these galaxies are actually lying in the very distant universe, and this is why we need models to predict in a good way uh, how much we have to expect of the distant space and how much star production we have to expect in these very early cosmic times. So, the problem that we have with UV and infrared measurements can be presented in this way. The star formation rate coming from the luminosity uh, estimated just from the UV itself is much lower compared to the infrared ones. So we actually always need a, a good match between the UV and infrared to have the proper star formation rate of a galaxy. Another very important statistical property of galaxies is luminosity functions. We can actually spot a large number of galaxies all over the cosmic times and then divide the numbers and luminosities per certain beam to explore do they evolve over cosmic times. So as you can see here, we have an evolution of the luminosities of very massive and dusty galaxies seen from different telescopes. So the outline of this work came uh, from 2013, and today we have even more refined measurements of these luminosity, luminosity functions. But uh, all these studies agree in one thing. There is a very high and large tail of the very massive and luminous objects seen in the very early universe, and all these galaxies are basically waiting to be explored because we still are lacking techniques to select them in a proper way. On the other hand, as you can see in this gray curve here, the galaxies that are very powerful in the infrared regime are not so common in the uh, local universe. For example, this gray curve is representing the, the most local ones, while the orange one representing the most distant ones. So this is the fraction of galaxies falling in this luminosity range, and this is the luminosity of these galaxies, starting from the low luminosity regime to the most powerful luminosity regime. So what we observed till now is that there are some very powerful star-forming and dusty galaxies which are very massive in a very early universe. So one of the theoretical knowledges we are exploring right now is actually uh, understanding how can be so fast that the dust and high mass are produced in the very early cosmic times. If we want to, to fit the points that are belonging to these curves, astronomers are usually using either double power law or so-called Schechter function fit. You can see later that these kind of functions are used in a, in a wide range of um, different galaxy populations. What is also very important to be understood from the statistical point of view is the redshift distribution of galaxies. And today, we also know that the most of these galaxies are peaking at the redshift around two, with a very large and uh, long tail extending uh, to very high redshifts as well. How does it relate to uh, SEDs of these galaxies? 
So from the massive to less massive ones, you can see that there is a change of the peak of their SED. So the most massive ones are peaking in the longer wavelengths, while the less massive ones are peaking towards the shorter wavelengths, which says something about the dust temperature of these galaxies. Also, we have another important physical and statistical point. So this is the star formation rate of galaxies placed in different mass ranges. As we saw in one of the previous slides, we had an evolution in their luminosity functions, while here we have the evolution of their star forming properties. Placing these star forming properties of galaxies in one, uh, let's say, small and simple cartoon, we can see something like this. We have uh, masses of galaxies, and then the evolution of star formation rate. The most of the galaxies observed in the universe are following what astronomers like to say a main sequence, which means that the uh, newly born stars are actually uh, pr are produced in amount of stars they already have. While there are some offsets, so there are galaxies called starbursts, and the offset between these two lines is usually 0 0.3, 0 0.5 dex. While there are also other galaxies with very high masses, but with very low or no ongoing star formation. These galaxies we call red and dead. So how these star formation events relate to different cosmic times? Here we have a different evolution, the evolution of black hole accretion rate and also the evolution of star formation rate. What is very intriguing is that both of these things are picking more or less in the same redshift range, which is counterintuitive because uh, we expect that star formation activity is uh, uh, diverse, different from the AGN activity, because we expect that uh, powerful AGNs are actually um, stopping star formation. So why we need a big extragalactic surveys in the future to explore more is because of this. Most of the points of star forming galaxies are coming from the rest frame UV observations, while the very dusty and mo most massive galaxies are observed up to the redshift four, and we are lacking direct constraints in this redshift regime. This says that the most powerful telescopes in the near future will be uh, leading the most dustiest and massive galaxies in the early cosmic times. So how theory match or don't match observations. Or we can see in different way from the case example, following the question, what lies behind this extreme nature of most massive star forming galaxies? In particular, is it the same if the massive galaxy uh, live and evolve in the under dense or very over dense environment? So we are going back to the, one of these slides where I posted the questions related to the evolution of massive galaxies. In particular, what gives the rise of the star formation in very early cosmic times? Then the second question is like, do we understand in a good way all these time scales? And the third question is like, what stops the star formation in these galaxies? So let's say that we have a very massive, very distant and very powerful star forming galaxies in the universe. These are the examples. Gravitational enhanced galaxy, merger or compact starburst galaxies. What is common to all of them is that they have extreme stellar masses, 100 billion solar masses, then extreme dust luminosities, very extreme star formation rate, rates, which are almost 1,000 times higher than the star formation rate of our own galaxy Milky Way, and very small and compact sizes like this, or very extended like one. They have a large amount of molecular gas, atomic carbon, and then dense molecules. To explore this idea, we can dig either in simulations or in observations. From simulations, we expect that the most massive halos, like as we see in the local clusters, are virialized and full of the red sequence galaxies. If you go back in time and see the same thing on the very high redshift, we can infer a higher density peak but we actually don't know which galaxies we have to use to trace these peaks in the real observations. One of the new ideas that came from the recent observational studies is that the most powerful star forming galaxies can be used as tracers of these so-called protoclusters. 
I put a sketch of the evolution of these galaxies in this slide. So starting from the very early cosmic times, we have a one halo that is dominating to this unvirialized structure, and the star formation rate is the most prominent in this regime. Other halos are either populated or not populated by galaxies, and during the different time scales, this region can be populated with different kind of galaxies, and then the contribution of the central star forming one will decrease. But what is more important, this one is usually seen as one of the most dustiest sources in the early universe. This means that telescopes, for example, Herschel or ALMA, can be used to directly spot these centers of the potential protoclusters. The galaxies that are rising and evolving in protoclusters are experiencing uh, enhanced uh, accretion rate and also enhanced um, a merger rate. So the probability that uh, they are experiencing also very high star formations is very huge. After the peak of their activity, they are slightly going to die and form the virialized structure we know as a galaxy cluster in the early universe. All these red circles are presenting the red galaxies as we said before, they have uh, no ongoing star formation. This is a very simple picture, but uh, the, one of the most important observational studies uh, in the near future will be dedicated to actually confirm or disprove uh, this idea. So in the near future, to prevail this problem, we expect some very powerful observational uh, observatories uh, they will help us to resolve the acidities of the different galaxies in different uh, wavelengths. So the responsible for the radio uh, wavelength is the future largest uh, interferometer called SKA. Uh, for the optical view of the wide field of angle uh, to cover the large, large number of protocluster candidates is Euclid. It, it will be dedicated also to cosmological studies while for, uh, to resolve the um, spectroscopy and the near-infrared and mid-infrared view of these most distant dust galaxies is actually the main role of the James Webb Space Telescope that we expect to be launched in two years from now. So some takeaway messages of this lecture are above. Galaxy evolution is very important and complex process and it has to yet to be understood. Most problematic question related to galaxy evolution is how did massive galaxies born and uh, which process actually stopped their star formation? And the third important uh, message is how to systematically select and inspect the, physical, uh, the physics of these galaxies and environments of these galaxies. As you saw from this lecture, the diverse process of uh, physical interactions are leading to galaxy formation and evolution. If you want to ask yourself some additional questions, don't hesitate. As you can see, you can lead some new branch of the galaxy formation and evolution in the future.